Hey, Fellowship family, happy 4th of July weekend. Yes. I hope that you've been able to have some good food, hang out with friends or family, but we are so glad that you've chosen to be here with us today. My name is Stephanie Porter. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm Michael Field. I'm also a pastor here. And here at Fellowship, we are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we exist to make disciples. That's right, that's who we are, and we have so much going on in the life of our church this summer. Way too much to talk about right now, but we just wanna invite you to just follow us. Uh, follow us on social, connect with us on our website, madeforfellowship.com, and you can stay up to date on everything that's going on in the life of our church. And with that, we're, we're just not going to waste any time. We're going to get on to worship. Yeah, we, are. Uh, we love worshiping God together here. So wherever you are, just prepare your heart and let's enter into a time of worshiping Him. Oh, we call on the name of Jesus. Yes, we do. Yes, we love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name. Yes, we do. Yeah. 
We're calling on your name
Hey, Fellowship fam, as we continue the Galatians series, each week we are highlighting a different area of ministry and talking with people on our team that are helping do the amazing work week in and week out on the front lines. And today we have our counseling department. So what is counseling and what kind of services do you provide for our people and why is it important? All right, so let's, just, let's talk about what it is, mm -hmm. what y'all doing, and why it matters. Yeah. Um, well, what we do is we meet with individuals, teens, parents, couples, families. We meet with literally anybody um, that wants to come into our offices. And what we do is create a safe space, right? We just talk. We talk about your life. We talk about relationships. We mm. talk about whether it's a present day situation, like, okay, how do I deal with my anxiety, my depression? Um, how do I deal with everyday stress yeah. or work-life balance? Some people come in with immense trauma and they want to talk about their childhoods. So yeah. like we just create a safe space to talk, mm. to address things that they can't with family and friends. So, I mean, so walking around in an abundance of denial is not the most ideal way to deal with stuff? I mean, you can do it. You're not going to be happy, but <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Yo, what has it been like with like COVID, racial unrest, political upheaval? I mean, with all the things that's been happening, what, is it, what has it been like being a counselor in a church during a season like this? Well, Fellowship's unique. Uh, since the first time I came here, one of our, our focuses is that we're multi-ethnic, intergenerational. That multi-ethnic piece is so dense when it comes to therapy. There's a lens that often exists um, that I'm unaware of when I'm sitting with someone from a different background. Mm -hmm. They're unaware of when they're sitting with their spouse of a different background. And so counseling has always been rich with the need for reconciliation regarding race. Mm -hmm. When you have trauma that has happened in the last few years, there's another element that needs to be redeemed, yeah. even in a counseling space. And one of the archetypes of a therapist is a good mother. And so part of our role is to sit and say, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to have experienced it. And in many circumstances, I won't have to really sit and say, I'm so sorry that it has felt that way. Mm -hmm. So the concept of empathy and really sitting in a space mm -hmm. where first we believe someone's experience to be able to move toward them, to say, I want to hold this pain for you. Mm. Um, it, it really does do something after talking about it. Yeah. We still may not be able to identify what the problem is, but the sharing of the problem, um, especially when it comes to the, you know, differentiation of ethnicity is holding that for each other feels very healing mm. and very hopeful. That's good. And you said that like a therapist, so I felt used like, I am so sorry mm -hmm. i've been practicing that in the bathroom in the mirror because <laughs> so my therapist yeah. said i'm not doing it well um <laughs> so i've been i've been i'm like, I am so sorry. shoot i gotta get it right i'm so it's so, just, so. Uh, parenting is the best you. practice to oh say i'm sorry mm -hmm. all the time. i know i know i know tell me some stories of highlights of how you seen god move in the counseling department yeah, I mean, I think honestly, we were, when COVID first hit, I mean, everyone was like, okay, what do I do with myself? Like everything froze, especially in March, where I think physically everyone was dealing with, okay, how do I just stay home? Yeah. But also in the home, I had a lot of people come in and they're like, I haven't talked to my mom meaningfully in like years. Like, what do I do with these people that I live with? And they had to address things that they've been running away from. Wow. Like, and I think a lot of people were really distraught by that. And anxiety was huge. I mean, I felt like all my sessions were just how to deal with anxiety for some point, like a solid three months. Like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And yeah. Anxiety and people who were already alone feeling very much like a hermit. Isolation, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, we have always benefited from is sitting in the proximity of a church. Mm. Within a church yeah. ministry, as one of a church ministry, we exit our people into ministry. And we know, um, we actually know we're doing a good job when we stop seeing our people, which mm. I feel like <laughs> is the best thing ever. It's like raising kids and they leave and they're like, we're good. Good. We got it. We know how to like, get to someplace. But Mission accomplished. One of the things that we see at Fellowship because of just the abundance of ministry and need around us is that when people leave our offices, they go and serve and mm -hmm. they serve in 
recovery ministry. They serve as chaplains. Um, they serve specifically, we have two wonderful women who at the beginning of COVID both lost their husbands at the same week. Mm -hmm. And these two women's lives have intersected in so many ways, though they didn't have a lot of commonality ahead of time. Um, they've both come together and now will start a grief ministry. Wow. That fellowship will, will start out in the fall. And it's just a sense of understanding of shared experience, but yeah. also well, looking around to say, this helped me, who else needs it? Wow. And I love that that can happen. And that really is healing. That really is movements, yeah. which yeah. we love to see. That's oh, beautiful. Yeah. It's um, so cool to see we've got a grief ministry coming in the future. Mm -hmm. What else do we have coming, coming up in counseling? What could we be looking forward to? Well, yeah. we have a growing partnership with Fuller Seminary. And mm -hmm. one of the things we've been growing toward is just our ability to not only see people, mm -hmm. but have other therapists in our offices seeing people that we would oversee. Yeah. So the state of California and the whole nation, when you're gonna be a therapist, you have to have 3,000 hours. Yeah. And during that 3,000 hours, you need to be somewhere being observed. And so we have the chance to be, begin to slowly add therapists into our offices to see our people yeah. doubling tripling our capacity to see wonderful and we're looking yeah. forward to that in the coming years that will just continue to allow us to expand um, what we do and yeah. where we do it for our people Amen. seeing more people is always good <laughs> yeah and I think normalizing the opportunity to receive help yes normalizing uh, therapy in the sense of doesn't mean you have to be in a crisis. Yeah. Doesn't mean you have to be inept or somehow insufficient in your ability to maintain. It's yeah. an opportunity to come alongside godly counsel um, and to have someone walk with you mm -hmm. in a place that's safe, in a place where you can be honest, um, and in a place where you can then invite God into that safe and honest place so that he can give you the help and the hope that we all need from time to time. So thank you for your work, for your investment in our church's mental health, as well as spiritual health, so that we could all be healthy for God's glory. Thank you guys. Wow, Steph, that was such a powerful video. Yes. And at, at Fellowship, we want every single person who's a part of our community to be known and cared for. And for us, sometimes that means Jesus and therapy, right? That we love and follow Jesus, but sometimes we need space uh, for more intense and more intensive counseling. And so know that when you give to fellowship, you give through fellowship to create these spaces where people can be known and cared for, where they can uh, unload their burdens and unpack what's actually going on in their life with a counselor. We are so deeply thankful for our counseling ministry. So fellowship, we just wanna take this moment and invite you to give and as you give to us, you give through us towards ministries like this. You can see the information on the screen. And uh, we want to invite you to give, but more than anything, just thank you for your faithfulness in continuing to give to ministries like this. Yes, and it is because you are above and beyond generosity that we are able to send 150 campers up to camp this 150? week. 150? 150. That's so thank you so much. And here at Fellowship, we say camp equals impact. And I actually gave my life to Christ at middle school camp. That's so amazing. I gave mine to Christ <laughs> as a sophomore in high school yes. yeah, at camp. And we're certain fellowship that if we could connect with each of you, that you're connected to camp in some way, shape, or form. And so we want to invite you right now to just extend your hands and we're just going to pray a special prayer um, for the teams that are there right now and headed up tomorrow. And if you have a camper that's going, I encourage you to just insert their name and make it personal. Um, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the work that you're doing in the lives of our young people here at Fellowship. God, we pray a special prayer of protection and blessing over each child, over each student, and over each volunteer um, that has said yes to the next generation, that has said yes uh, to going to camp this week. God, we know that uh, by the time a child is nine, uh, they form their belief system. So we know the work and the foundations you're laying this week are so vital to their faith development and them choosing Jesus. And God, we know that by the age of 15, um, it's most likely that someone will say yes to Jesus. So we are praying for transformation. Um, we are praying for um, kids and students to say yes to you this week, Lord. And we are covering all of the unique family dynamics and scenarios that are also going going up to that mountain, Lord, and we pray 
In those moments where we get to leave behind the busyness and the distractions um, of this world and this life, Lord, that they just get to sit and be still with you and connect with you in real ways, Lord. So go before them, be beside them, and follow behind them. We pray this in your holy and mighty and powerful name. And everybody said together, Amen. Amen. All right, uh, grab your Bible and maybe something to take some notes with. Uh, but first, let's hear from our pastor, Albert. Hey, Fellowship, we are going strong in the Galatian series. We got off to a great start, and I'm so excited to bring somebody brand new, but also very old to the stage. She has been around for quite a few years serving here at Fellowship. What's become evident is this young woman has a calling on her life. Not only is she a gifted leader, a passionate pastor, but she is an extraordinary communicator of the gospel. So it is, it is, it is high time to have her bless our platform, bless our people as she opens up the word of God. You know or she's been around. We used to call her uh, Hannah Jirasi, but now we call her Hannah Helwidge. She just got married. Would you give her a warm fellowship welcome? Welcome, opening up God's word and continuing in our series on the book of Galatians. Welcome, Hannah Helwidge. Come on. Hey family, welcome to church. My name is Hannah and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship. And this September, I will celebrate my eighth anniversary of being on this staff team. And I gotta tell you, even after all of these years, I am still so grateful and so excited to get to regularly witness the Spirit's work on display in us and through us. What a gift it is to be a part of this community. Today, we are continuing in our Galatians series. It's week two, and we are pressing forward in our reading of the book of Galatians as we together learn what it means to be a people reconciled, reconciled both to God and to one another. So we'll pick up today where Pastor Michael left off last week. So please join me in the book of Galatians, chapter one, verse 11. Hear the word of the Lord. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy and they praised God because of me. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you God that not once has your word returned void. So Lord, once again, we ask you, would you form us by this word, mold us more into your likeness today than we were yesterday. Would you make us into a people reconciled for your glory and for our good? In Jesus' victorious name, we pray, amen. In about six months, I will turn 30. And turning 30 feels like a really big milestone. From what I hear, being 30 is this magical land where people are confident in who they are, they understand how the stock market works, and they can finally afford to get guacamole at Chipotle every time, not just sometimes. This sounds great. And as I approach 30, I've been starting to reflect on my 20s the lessons I've learned, the memories I've made. 
And one of the most important things I have learned in my 20s, and in particular in the last year or two, is that posture matters. Posture really, truly matters. And the reason that it matters is because posture impacts outcome. Our posture, or the way we physically or metaphorically set ourselves up, it impacts the outcome that we experience. And as someone who's almost 30, I have learned the painful but incredibly valuable lesson that the way I sit, the way I sleep, the way I posture myself to exercise will inevitably impact how I feel. All it takes is a five minute nap on the wrong pillow and I can't turn my head for a whole week. Posture impacts outcome. It's true in sports, how we stand when we're batting or throwing or kicking a ball. It matters because posture impacts outcome. It matters in music, how we sit as we play an instrument, how we engage our core while singing. That all matters because posture impacts outcome. It's true even in relationships. And I'm learning this in a fresh new way after recently getting married. The way we approach disagreements or conflict, it matters because posture impacts outcome. The way we set ourselves up, physically or metaphorically, will make or break the outcome that we experience. And in today's text, we learn that when it comes to gospel reconciliation, posture matters big time. If we are to become a people who are reconciled both vertically in our relationship to God and horizontally in our relationship with one another, our posture will impact the outcome that we experience. The apostle Paul here, he is writing a letter to a group of churches in Galatia, but this isn't his first interaction with them. Years prior to writing this letter, this letter that was later added to the canon of scripture, this letter that we now know as the book of Galatians, years prior to this, Paul had been in Galatia preaching the good news of freedom and redemption through Jesus. A bunch of people came to faith and Paul helps plant a couple churches in Galatia to sustain this movement of new believers. And then he heads on his way to continue to evangelize in the next region and the next. But now we have a situation in Galatia. A group of people have come through and are systematically undoing the evangelism work of Paul. They're telling these Galatian Christians, these new believers, that the gospel isn't enough to reconcile them to God and to one another. They're telling them that if they really wanna be saved, they're gonna have to abide by Jewish law first. So Paul, he catches wind of this and unable to physically head back to Galatia to set the record straight, he writes this letter. And in the section of the letter that we read today, Paul reminds the Galatians of his autobiography. He tells them, and certainly not for the first time, what his life looked like before Jesus and what it looks like after Jesus in order to remind them that this, this is what the gospel does. And the rest of the letter to the Galatians, Paul will call them back to that gospel, that which transforms, that which sets them free, that which reconciles and unifies them to God and to neighbor. Paul will cover all of that later on. But first, what Paul is doing in today's text is modeling the three postures that we too must engage if we want to be a people reconciled. Posture impacts outcome. And if the outcome we desire is to be a people who are reconciled vertically and horizontally, then we ought to posture ourselves accordingly. The three postures of reconciliation are this. Number one, truth telling. Number two, repentance. And number three, surrender. So let's dive in. The first posture of reconciliation is truth telling. Picking up again in verse 11, I want you to know brothers and sisters that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Here, Paul is telling the truth. 
The truth is he wasn't always an apostle. The truth is he wasn't always team Jesus. The truth is he wasn't always building and encouraging churches. The truth of Paul's experience is that he used to be actively, intentionally and continually attempting to destroy this Christian church. But he doesn't deny it nor does he pretend that he has it all together now. No, Paul owns the details of his former life before he encountered Christ. Apart from that posture of truth telling, we have no hope for reconciliation. If we can't name the truth that something needs to be reconciled, then we cannot reconcile. Truth telling this posture, it's kind of like an X-ray. Have you ever broken a bone? Back when I was in college at Azusa Pacific University, I broke my pinky toe playing barefoot soccer. And I know it was a dumb idea. Hindsight is 2020. Wear shoes if you're going to play soccer. But anyway, I'm playing barefoot soccer and I tripped on an uneven patch of grass on the field. And as I was on my way down, I kicked my opponent's heel. And the problem was my pinky toe went to one side of his ankle and the rest of my toes went to the other side. It looked like this. And at first my foot definitely hurt and was definitely swollen, but I didn't know if it was broken or sprained or dislocated or something else altogether. So I went to the doctor and the doctor did an X-ray and sure enough, I snapped my left pinky bone right in half. So they reset it. They gave me a boot and some crutches and in a few months, everything was fine. But the point is this, prior to the x-ray, I knew something was wrong with my toe. It definitely hurt. There was a lot of tension and swelling. I couldn't put much weight on it, but I could not begin the process of healing until I got an x-ray and had confirmation of exactly where the break was. The x-ray named the reality of what was broken so that what was broken could be healed. The posture of truth-telling is our gospel x-ray. When we confess and tell the truth about what is broken, about what has been said or done or believed, then and only then are we able to begin healing. Without truth-telling, we cannot become a people who are reconciled. So my question for you is, what do you need to tell the truth about? What needs confessing in your life? In your relationship with God, in your relationship with your partner, in your relationship with your roommate or your colleagues or your students or your parents, what do you need to tell the truth about? Truth-telling is how we get an accurate diagnosis of what is broken. If we wanna reset a broken bone so it can heal, if you want a relationship to be reconciled, we first have to posture ourselves for truth-telling. Individually, truth-telling is our posture, but this also applies communally. What do we need to tell the truth about? As a church, we've been hobbling around on a broken pinky toe, unwilling to name that it's broken and therefore unable to actually heal it. If we desire to be a people reconciled, a people living in right relationship with one another, a community that looks like the multi-ethnic intergenerational kingdom of God, we have to name the places where we've gotten it wrong. We have to be honest about our history locally and nationally. We have to confess the sin of systemic injustice in all of its evil forms. We have to tell the truth, not deny it, not sugarcoat it, not write policies and laws that hide it. There will be no reconciliation without truth telling. We can't fix a broken thing if we don't first name that the thing is indeed broken. This is the first posture of reconciliation truth telling. What do you need to tell the truth about? The second posture of reconciliation is repentance. Let's pick up again in verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Paul has just encountered the living God, and his immediate response is repentance. 
This is the second posture of reconciliation. The first is truth telling and Paul has already done that. And now he retells the moment of his repentance experience. Repentance is feeling remorse or regret for one's actions. And then not just feeling the remorse or regret, but actually turning away from them. It's the idea of changing your mind about something that you've been doing or saying or believing, and then turning away from it to head in a different direction. For Paul, that looked like turning from his persecution of the Christian church and heading in a different direction. The opposite direction, actually. See, Paul was a religious fanatic. He was seeking to destroy the people that he believed were opposed to God. But after his encounter with that God, everything was different. He turned and changed and began proclaiming the name he once sought to destroy. He went from persecutor to preacher. Now, repentance won't always be that dramatic, but it is still critical to reconciliation. And I think it's interesting how these first two postures work together. There's a little bit of an order here, a necessary progression from the first posture to the second, because you can tell the truth and not repent, but you cannot repent without first telling the truth. It's like when you catch a kid doing something wrong. Now, I don't have kids, but I've been around enough kids to know that truth telling does not always mean honest repentance. Now, parenthetically, let me just say, since everyone and their mother has been asking since I got married, yes, my husband and I do hope to have kids someday, Lord willing, but we'll be waiting a few years and it's 100% free to mind your business, thank you. But anyway, kids, kids and telling the truth, catching a kid doing something wrong. I once was babysitting this little girl who snuck into the pantry and ate a few cookies while I was in the bathroom. She was old enough to understand the concept of rules and authority, and she knew that she was not supposed to have any cookies without permission. She had chocolate all over her face when I came back out from the restroom. So it was pretty obvious that she'd taken some cookies and eaten them. And when I asked her why there was chocolate on her face, she said, I had some cookies. Now, developmentally speaking, she was way ahead of the game for being able to name her dessert transaction in the moment. But spiritually speaking, sister was not at all interested in repenting and going a different direction with her actions. She told the truth, but she didn't repent. She wanted more cookies. You can tell the truth, but not repent, but you cannot repent without first telling the truth. So once we've engaged the first posture of truth telling, once we've named and not denied reality in our vertical and horizontal relationships, we are ready to practice repentance. We're ready to turn from what we had been doing and go a different direction. What do you need to repent of in order to be reconciled? The good news of the gospel is not just for someday, but it's for today. The good news of the gospel isn't just about cleaning up our souls and getting us into heaven for eternity. Does the gospel do that? Absolutely. But that's actually only part of it. The good news of the gospel is for someday and eternity. And it's also for today in 2022, in our homes and schools and workplaces and cities and states and beyond. God is creating a new family a people of unity and justice and reconciliation on earth as it is in heaven right now. One pastor says it this way, the cross of Christ isn't just a bridge that will get us to God. It is also a sledgehammer that will break down the walls that separate us. God is in the business of reconciliation right now, but our involvement requires our repentance. What do you need to repent of? For some of us, we need to repent of our complacency. We know that gospel reconciliation is the will and the way of Jesus, but darn it, we are too comfortable to change. It's so much easier to lean back into our festering greed and our unchecked selfishness than it is to turn and go in the direction of justice and righteousness. For some of us, we need to repent of our desire for uniformity over unity. We like the sound of reconciliation, you know, maybe that could be good, but we prefer sameness to oneness. We'd rather pursue uniformity over a biblical unity. We'd rather be colorblind than honor the Imago Dei revealed in every ethnicity, every race and every culture. For some of us, we need to repent of our denial. 
We've spent a long time trying to convince ourselves and others that systemic oppression in all of its forms, racism, sexism, classism, and so on, that they just aren't real. It feels easier and far less scary to just look away, to pretend to not know, to deny the lived experiences of oppression. Or maybe for you, it's time to repent of the need to be right or your quickness to take offense or something else altogether. This certainly is not an exhaustive list. But what do you need to repent of? The thing about repentance is that it is perhaps our most powerful witness. I mean, Paul knows this clearly. That's why he brings up his conversion story so often. He knows that if people hear what he was doing and how much he turned around to go a different direction, if people hear that that repentance and that change was fueled by the spirit, then they're almost guaranteed to want to hear more about that God. So he shares his story a lot in the New Testament. Can you imagine how much more compelling our witness would be as individuals, but also as a church, not just fellowship, not just Midtown, but the capital C church at large, how much more compelling would our witness be if we practiced this posture of repentance? There will be no reconciliation without repentance. We cannot fix a broken thing if we don't first tell the truth and name that it is broken. And second, if we don't stop the process of breaking it. Paul's letter to the Galatians shows us that the second posture of reconciliation is repentance. And now third and finally, the third posture of reconciliation is surrender. We'll pick up again in verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas. Cephas is Peter, by the way and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. So Paul has told the truth about his past. He's retold the story of his repentance and his turn into another direction. And finally, he models for us the posture of surrender. Following his conversion, Paul surrenders to God. He surrenders to the pace and the priorities and the plans of God. He hadn't been looking to make a life change like this, but God called Paul through grace and in response, Paul surrendered to God's plan for his life. The posture of surrender is critical for us too if we hope to become a reconciled people. To be reconciled, we, like Paul, must surrender to God's pace and priorities and plans. And the way we do that is through prayer and prophetic imagination. So first let's talk about surrendering to prayer. Prayer is the vehicle by which we arrive at reconciliation with God, which is our vertical reconciliation. And once reconciled to God and with God, we are able to pivot and be reconciled with our neighbors, our horizontal reconciliation. Without prayer, we have no fuel and no means by which we can love others the way that God loves us. Pastor Rich Velotis says it this way, many people work for justice and reconciliation without any commitment to prayer. And when we live this way, we see only ourselves as righteous heroes, exposing the powers of the world while not seeing how complicit we are as parts of the world's sinful structures. Prayer forges humility and opens us up to the love of God out of which we continue to work for healing. Apart from the power of the spirit, we absolutely will not become a people reconciled, neither vertically or horizontally. Prayer is our access to that Holy Spirit power. So if we hope to be reconciled, we must surrender ourselves to prayer. And secondly, we must surrender ourselves to prophetic imagination. And what I mean by that is our efforts to be reconciled, our work to tear down walls and heal the world from individual and systemic evils, all of that work must be empowered by a vision for the earth as it is in heaven. 
but to see and work towards something that doesn't yet exist, that requires imagination. And in this case, when we're working towards a biblical vision for a redeemed and restored world, it requires prophetic imagination. It requires naming and then co-creating with God that which does not yet exist. When we surrender to a prophetic imagination for reconciliation, we're able to participate in reconciliation on a macro level and on a micro level. And y'all, this is a very important distinction. The reconciliation we're working towards requires prophetic imagination because it's all encompassing. It's individual and institutional. It's at the national level and it's across our dinner tables. To be the people of God, to be a people of this book is to be a people who do reconciliation both ways. To do one without the other is incomplete. If we're only ever pursuing reconciliation individually and relationally, we miss out on the fullness of the gospel. And if we're only pursuing reconciliation in systems and institutions, we still miss out on the fullness of the gospel. Our God is making all things new, not just some of the things. And Jesus invites us to prophetically imagine and work towards a vision for reconciliation that is both a gospel that is concerned about your relationship with your boss and the relationship between racial groups, a gospel that dismantles bitterness and resentment in your friendships and dismantles racially discriminatory practices in housing and education and criminal justice and healthcare, a gospel that is good news for whoever is in your living room and whoever is in the White House. The gospel does both. It's macro and it's micro, it's vertical and it's horizontal. It is making all things new. And to engage that reconciling gospel in our lives, it requires our surrender to a prophetic, imaginative vision for the earth as God originally made it to be. There will be no reconciliation without surrender to prayer and surrender to prophetic imagination. We cannot fix a broken thing if we don't first tell the truth and name that it is broken, if we don't then stop the process of breaking it, and if we don't surrender to a new way of being where it never becomes broken again. Paul's letter to the Galatians shows us these postures. When it comes to reconciliation, posture really matters. Posture impacts outcome. And if the posture or if the outcome we desire is to be reconciled, to be restored and redeemed both vertically and horizontally, then our posture must be truth telling and repentance and surrender. As I wrap up, I do wanna be clear though, the reconciliation, that is God's work. The absolute best of our intentions and ideas and efforts cannot make us a people reconciled. The reconciliation is God's work Our work is the truth telling and the repentance and the surrender. In these three postures, God can make a persecutor into a preacher. In these three postures, God can heal our broken world at the macro level and the micro level. And in these three postures, God can make us a people reconciled for his glory and for our good, amen. Oh
I don't know about you, but I'm just so thankful for a time to sit in God's Word together and just for such a powerful message from Hannah uh, today. And as she pastored us through the second half of the first chapter of Galatians, I just want to invite you, um, if you felt like something she was saying was speaking directly to you, and you feel like things are coming up in your life that you want to talk about, uh, we're here for you. Uh, you can reach out to us, you can see the information uh, of how you can reach out to us and how you can connect with us. But uh, we, we want you to know that you are known, you are cared for, and we want you to find yourself deeper in community here. We want you to find yourself uh, just being cared for in the place that you're at. So please reach out to us. We have pastors, we have leaders standing by waiting to connect with you. Yes, and fellowship, again, we want to extend a heartfelt thank you for your above and beyond generosity. And if this might be your first time giving, all the information is on the screen. You can download an app, do it online, but thank you so much. Now, I just would love to bless you, and I pray that you have a fantastic week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. Amen, fellowship. Amen. See you later. See you next week.